Pastor Allen, Pastor Chris here at the Lawrence Joel Veterans Memorial Coliseum. Uh, great context to remember lots of great basketball games uh, here, uh, just on the heels of all the March Madness and a good place to remember the kind of spirit of celebration that fans have when they have a great victory. But we're talking today about in, in the Christian gospel, what happens when we celebrate really is we're praising God. And as we learn about what it means to be more blessed through giving than receiving, we're going to talk today about a mystery uh, that is another part of the gigantic secret of Christian blessedness, and that is it's more blessed to praise than to be praised. In a world that clamors for praise and attention and fame, uh, the Christian secret is, no, the great joy is to do what we're designed to do, and that's praise God. In our text today is Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things, what you've learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Uh, it really is a concept that is this simple. To rejoice means to have joy again. So there is a huge connection between rejoicing and having joy, praising God and the joy in our lives. And I think this is a fitting context because uh, the spirit of celebration that comes up when we have, uh, I don't know, great, great victories, you know. So, all right, Mr. Basketball here, tell me some of your favorite basketball celebration moments. It's got to have to do your hero, Michael Jordan. Right, right there, so, sure. so I'm in college, and uh, Michael Jordan had won three championships while I was in high school. He'd taken a year off to play baseball. Turns out it's not the same sport, so he took a little break there, and he came back. And at that point, the Utah Jazz were kind of growing in prominence. They have two Hall of Famers. They had you know, these, these great players, and John Stockton was great, and Carl Malone was great, and the Bulls were down. I mean, they, I thought they were going to lose this championship, and I remember distinctly Michael Jordan kind of shoving Byron Russell out of the way, was <laughs> and shooting a jump shot over him, and uh, I remember yelling so loud that the RA on my floor came down to make sure that I wasn't in trouble, <laughs> and he's like, no one should celebrate a basketball game like that. I was like, what else are we going to celebrate like that? And it got me thinking, you have a memory like that? Well, I was uh, on the Carolina campus as a student in 1982 when Michael Jordan shoots the game winner for the national championship. I yes, was three. You were three. Well, you were alive, I at least. Alive. He was, Pastor Chris was alive when yeah. I was in college. So let's keep that straight. <laughs> but Chris, it was so fun because uh, as soon as, as he makes the, sh the shot, and then uh, who was it threw the ball back right to James Worthy, uh, uh, the uh, Georgetown player? I don't remember. Is Fred that? Brown, maybe. maybe. I, think, I, I, think he's, I think I'm right about that. Just throws it you know, in his panic. James Worthy, game's over. Yeah. And uh, it just was completely instinctive. Nobody had uh, said, hey, everybody, let's meet on Franklin Street uh, when this is all over. Instead, everybody just doesn't know what to do. They just have to jump and like run somewhere. So everybody just runs to Franklin Street and uh, no, nobody had any idea what to expect. It was, it was not a good time to have left your parked car on Franklin Street. <laughs> they, they do, I saw it, I was just like, I don't want to get trampled out here in the celebration. Uh, interestingly, uh, this year when Carolina beat Duke at home, and I've got a- I'm sorry, I may miss that. <laughs> yeah, when, I, when Carolina beat Duke at okay. home this year, but uh, Abby is a freshman there, and she said, everybody stormed Franklin Street. She said, Daddy, she said, I was afraid I don't get trampled after. I said, yeah, don't get trampled after a win. But it says something about how there is a spontaneous um, overflow of celebration 
in something as simple as winning a basketball game. I, I, came, I came to so many uh, Wake Forest games, even as a kid, before they played at the Coliseum here, I would come with my best buddy, Bob. Uh, his dad was a big demon deke, and uh, they brought me to games. And so other than Carolina, I've always loved Wake Forest. And boy, there have been some great players here over the years. Um, I, you know, personally, I love the fact that Muggsy Bogues played here, who's 5'3". I tower over at Muggsy Bogues. Like he, made it, he, made, he made it to the NBA. But uh, getting to watch Chris Paul and Tim Duncan. And there have been some exciting moments uh, here in this Coliseum where the decibels get really loud and people just spawn But you know one of the things that I've been paying attention to through March, you know, all through the March Madness is it's fun to watch people win, but you can see the highlights of the buzzer beaters. You know, like where you think you've lost and then somebody makes an unlikely half court shot and all of a sudden buzzer sounds, you've won. Yeah. And in those situations, the ordinary decorum it loses its place. I mean, the players want to be gentlemen and they go shake the other team's hands, but even then they can't just help themselves. They start jumping on the person who had the buzzer beating shot. Sometimes the fans storm the, the, the floor. Why? What is this? It is to say, when a great victory has been won in an unlikely way that nobody saw coming, it's an even greater celebration. And in the Christian life, uh, praise to God is like that, but it comes from the infinite victory that was won through an infinite price of the sacrifice of Christ death on the cross and the resurrection, this surprised even the angels were longing to see into these things. And, and so when we gather as the people of God and we praise God together, we don't do so because, oh, we ought to be singing some songs. Mm -hmm. We do so because we can do no other except just lift up the one who's won this incredible victory. The Westminster divines were right. What is the chief end of man, the Westminster Catechism says, and the answer is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. I think so often of the glorifying God and the enjoyment of God as being part of the same, the same principle. It's the same heart principle. And as we are thinking this week in our study about how blessed a thing it is to praise God. I just encourage you to think much of the gospel and think much of the joy that is ours for what Christ has done for us. And what that does is it puts you in touch with the greatest victory that's ever been won. We don't celebrate and praise and worship God out of some sort of routine or ritual. But in a very real sense, Chris, what we do in a Sunday morning gathering is we come together and we announce the gospel and it's like we let ourselves hear it as if for the first time all over again and it elicits praise and celebration. Um, it's a, it's a, a, a beautiful thing to think that while giving our resources, giving our time, um, investing your gifts in serving others. All of this is a rich part of what it means to be more blessed through giving that may be the most fundamental and important piece of the Christian's life in giving is that we are every day giving praise to God. You know, one of the things that I love about March Madness and that last Monday night is to, they show this video compilation called One Shining Moment, right? <laughs> And it's this, these moments, just moment after moment after moment of all of these games of people finding unexpected joy. Yeah. Like the, they're all holding arms waiting for the end of it and it goes their way. And it could have been 50-50, right? It goes their way and they all celebrate. And I just frequently wonder, you know, in the Christian life, the end of the story is completely secure. Like this is the great hope of the book of yes. Revelation is that we know who sits on the throne. We know how the story ends. But yet we're still surprised somehow when in the middle of our kind of mundane average life, God intervenes and there's a spontaneous victory that restores our hope. And I just think about, Alan, our vision as a church, which I think is, you know, aggressively 
wonderful in some ways that we are a church that wants to you know share with the region yeah the healing presence of Jesus that we have so richly experienced and I think about all of the cities in our region and, and I think about the ways in which we are bringing that hope that unexpected joy to places where people just aren't hearing the gospel and aren't connecting with God's people to gather and then scatter to learn together you know what is it you think about the gospel itself that's giving hope to people? Yeah. Well, I think that, that when people have heard a message, what I would just call religion, that essentially says, if you will do this, then God won't punish you as much, yeah. or maybe he'll even bless you, but be on the lookout because you know if you start messing up, then you're not gonna be blessed. I think what happens, and we've seen this, you know, is that we're now an unchurched nation, right? I mean, majority of people don't go to church. I think a lot of people have just said, I just can't stand the weight of feeling that sort of bad news over my life. Yeah. And so very simply, what we are doing as a congregation through launching campuses where people are, through carrying the message of the gospel uh, through radio and digital outreach, through launching a ministry like Restorations where we tangibly want to help people. And every bit of it is rooted in this. The good news is powerful enough to change everything in our lives. Good news will rock your world. And so just keep in mind this image of the buzzer beater and the fans that cannot stop themselves from celebrating. And that's the kind of message that that we are proclaiming. We're talking about a message that is such good news that even as believers, we can just hardly believe it, but we do. And to the person who has yet to follow Christ, we want to proclaim a message that's such good news that at least they wish it were true. <laughs> and so I hope this week in your Bible study, you dig into this incredible, powerful principle. It's more blessed to praise than it is to be praised. <laughs>